All right, so let's get back to the physics. I want to tell you about the structure of gluons. Remember, empty space isn't empty. It's full of these quark and gluon field fluctuations. Let's have a look at it. I'm going to consider the energy density of the gluon field at each point in space and time. And that's just the square of the electric field strength and the magnetic field strength. And we add it up over those eight different gluon fields that are available. At each point in space time, yes, there are eight electric fields, eight magnetic fields. We add up the energy associated with those fields. And in order to view the structure, what I'm going to do is render regions where that energy density is high in red, uh, regions where the energy density is dropping down, we'll render in blue. And the lowest energy density regions, I'm not going to render them at all, and that way we can see in to the volume of space and have a look at what these things look like. So let me bring up the animation. We're looking at a region of space. It's big enough to hold maybe two protons, so it's a fairly small region. And you can see there's a red hot seething mess of gluons. What I need to do is smooth it out. I'm going to get rid of the short distance fluctuations so I can show you the longer distance interesting aspects of what's going on here. So I'll do a few steps forward in the animation. Each time I'm trying to remove short distance fluctuations and you can see then that we're now finally able to see some interesting structure in this gluon field. Let me run the animation for you now. So you can see that there are some areas where it was very easy to remove the energy density and other areas where it persists. And we understand the structure of the gluon fields and why those lumps persist, but this is absolutely critical to the origin of mass. So just a reminder that we're looking at an illustration of the energy density of a typical gluon field. When we do the lattice calculations, we average over hundreds to thousands of these configurations. What I want to do now is show you the time evolution of these lumps. Uh, we work on a periodic lattice, so as the movie runs, it will repeat, but you'll get an idea for the dynamics of empty space. So let's have a look at that. So as I step forward in time, you'll see some time evolution of these lumps, and perhaps the best way to see it is simply to run the animation. I'll spin it around so you can get a feel for the structure that's within this. First time we looked at this, I had a student that came down and said, you know, I hope you're not offended by this, but it looks a lot like a lava lamp. And I thought, yes, you're right, but it's even better than a lava lamp. Because although the lumps move around in a lava lamp, just like they do here, here it's better because they exist for a brief instant in time, and then they disappear, like this one here. There, gone. And here now, gone. So that's better than a lava lamp. But we were pleased to have that, uh, that phrase stick. This work was made quite popular when Professor Frank Wilczek uh, included this in his Nobel Prize acceptance lecture back in 2004. If you want to learn more about uh, the vacuum and that empty space isn't empty, you can also find the Veritasium channel on YouTube where you can see a video on empty space is not empty. Why is this so important? It's because those lumps that you're seeing in the QCD vacuum, they interact with the quarks and they generate mass. That's the origin of mass in the proton. That's what's going on. Here's a plot where on the x-axis, I'm using a measure of momentum transfer that governs the resolution at which you look. If you've seen a Fourier transform, you'll know that large momenta correspond to uh, short distances. So we've got short distance here. We've got large distances here. And you can see on the y-axis, we're looking at the apparent mass of a quark as it sits in the proton. Now out here, large momenta, short distances, not much is happening. You see the mass that was put into the simulation here, the dot dash curve, and a little bit of mass generation, but really nothing to get excited about. This area is called asymptotic freedom. It's a very important aspect of QCD. The interactions become weak at short distances. But at large distances, this is where you have dynamical mass generation. And so if you're looking at matter at the scale of a proton, that's a large scale in this game. 
and you see dynamical mass generation. And that, then, is the origin of mass in the universe. Here's an artistic rendition of the proton. So you can see the energy density of the gluons. We know that the quarks like to spend most of their time on top of those lumps. That's where you'll find them, most probably. And it's these interactions, then, that generate the mass of the quarks. But proton structure is more complicated than just three quarks. You can also have quark-antiquark -quark pairs. In this illustration, we have a strange quark and an anti-strange quark here. And that's part of the proton structure. And if you can see it, there's some gluon flux tubes here that bind these three quarks into a baryon like the proton. This one's actually the lambda. And you've got a U s bar, which is a K plus meson. These are sort of like molecular ideas. And that's part of the proton structure as well. So it's, it's complicated. But yes, the three quarks composing the proton, complemented by other quark-anti-quark -quark pairs, not just strange anti-strange, down anti-down, up anti-up is fine too. And you will find them sitting on top of the lumps. It's those lumps in the gluon field that give rise to mass. What's this? This is how experimentalists investigate the structure of the proton. The straight line here is an electron. It doesn't couple directly to the gluon field, so it just plows straight through. Same with the photon. Photon comes in here, hits a strange quark, so experimentalists can learn about how the strange quarks contribute to proton structure. And of course, they measure this outgoing electron and learn about structure through that measurement. If you want to learn more about flux tubes and meson baryon molecular states, again, you can go to the Veritasium channel, look for a video called Your Mass is not from the Higgs boson, and it really isn't. I like showing this animation because it gives me an opportunity to show you how supercomputers are used in calculating quantum chromodynamic properties. You're looking at a very small region of space. Again, it's about the size of a proton. The lumps you're looking at are regions in space where you could have a quark-anti-quark -quark pair, or maybe three quarks that would form a baryon, Within a single colored region, the energy associated with those quark any quark pairs, or three quarks, is finite. So you're actually looking at regions of space that QCD is creating, where you can have things like the very core of a proton, or the very core of a meson existing. You're looking at structures generated by QCD that govern the size of a proton. What's the animation? We're stepping forward through simulation time. We're proposing new link variables and asking QCD, is this a good choice? Is this a probable configuration? And if QCD says yes, then we keep it, and we keep moving forward in simulation time. Now, in the upper left corner, you can see that there's a temperature indicated there. And we're actually at the critical temperature of QCD. That's an interesting temperature. It's the temperature at which quarks are supposed to become free. You lose the confinement of quarks to within protons, and they're supposed to be able to travel very large distances with finite energy. So what we would expect to see then in this animation is that there would be a, one of the colors would win out over the other colors, that it would define then a very big region where quarks can propagate, with finite energy. And you can see here that the red color is, in fact, winning. And now you have the deconfinement of quarks, because quarks now can spread out to very, very large distances with finite energy. How big are the jobs that we run on Magnus? That's an interesting question. Well, we're running modern Fortran code uh, using the MPI, the message passing interface. We typically work with somewhere between 16 and 32 nodes. There's 24 cores per node, so we're looking at 384 to 768 cores running in parallel. And that's pretty small, actually, uh, these days. I mean, we could run a lot larger, but we don't need to. And by keeping it somewhat small, we can fit into the nooks and crannies of the machine and get extra time, which is so important. Our wall time is typically two to four hours, which is a nice, comfortable point at which we can checkpoint. Let me take you now 
to the cutting edge of what we're doing here at the University of Adelaide. And I want to talk about this animation that's running. This is a really interesting calculation because it's not only quantum chromodynamics that's been put on the lattice, but quantum electrodynamics is also there. Simultaneously, quark and color degrees of freedom are working with quantum electrodynamic degrees of freedom. Because remember, quarks carry charge. The up quark has charge two thirds, the down quark has charge minus a third. So these charges can interact with the photon field and that's part of this image. What are we looking at here? So the yellow and red blobs are regions of topological charge density that's large. It's kind of like the energy density, only instead of measuring E squared plus B squared, we're actually measuring the alignment of the electric and magnetic fields. And they can be aligned or they can be anti-aligned. In that case, that's the blue and green blobs where the color fields tend to be more anti-aligned than aligned. What about the red blobs? That's electric charge. That's the quarks in the vacuum generating pockets of positive charge. And the purple is the negative electric charge. And so charges and topological charge are moving around. And as those uh, charges move around, they generate interesting magnetic fields. And we're very keen to have a look and understand that. So this is work that James Zanotti and Ross Young at the University of Adelaide have been leading with uh, international collaborators. And the entire group is in fact working together now to analyze these uh, configurations and find out what the physics uh, is that's going on inside these supercomputers. We want to see it and understand it. So I now want to talk to you about the magnetic field. There's a magnetic field that's generated by the motion of those quarks. Uh, the electric charges that we were looking at in the previous animation. We want to understand how that magnetic field interacts with the quantum chromodynamic parts of what's going on in the vacuum. We talked about these yellow areas of being positive topological charge density and these greeny blue areas, negative topological charge density, associated with the alignment or anti-alignment of the color fields. They're interesting because they give rise to interesting combinations of the momentum of the quarks as they move in the vacuum and the direction of their magnetic moments or their angular momentum. And in fact, it means then that there will be interesting interactions of the quarks which are combined to have particular properties inside of the QCD areas. How do they interact with the magnetic field? Those are the kinds of things we're interested in. There's a wonderful effect called the chiral magnetic effect that we're looking for. But here's what the animation looks like and it's quite fascinating to watch. So here again, you've got QCD, topological charge density, like the energy density we were looking at in QCD earlier. You've got the electric charge in red and negative electric charge in purple. And as they move around, they generate this magnetic field. That's the vector field that we're plotting here. And it's the interaction of that magnetic field with the QCD degrees of freedom that gives rise to things like the chiral magnetic effect. That's what we're looking for and we're very pleased to have just found it. Let me summarize. It's an absolutely amazing time to be involved in lattice QCD research. Supercomputer development has been absolutely key. There's no way that we could do the things that we're doing today without the world's fastest supercomputers. At the same time, algorithmic development has been equally important. The breakthroughs have been amazing. And now we're actually to the point where the emergent phenomena of QCD is really being revealed. We're really learning how this fundamental quantum field theory governs the universe in which we live. It's also making it possible for us to understand QCD well enough that we can begin to search for physics beyond what we know. You can't start looking for new physics until you can accurately calculate the physics that you think you know. And we're there now. The role of the POSI Center is really central to the success that we've enjoyed here in Australia, in Lattice QCD, and it's a pleasure to thank our colleagues at the POSI Center for their support.